In today's world inside, full steam ahead, China's biggest in-person trade event, the Canton Fair, opening to fanfare and record participants. How does the fair tie into China's and the world's growth recovery? What are the fair highlights? And here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live from Beijing. China's economy grew by 4.5% year-on-year in the first quarter of 2023 versus 2.9% in the last quarter of 2022, posting a steady economic rebound, the National Bureau of Statistics said on Tuesday. China's southern city Guangzhou, meanwhile, rose out the red carpet for the 133rd China Import and Export Fair after three years of holding the fair online due to the pandemic. The Canton Fair, as it is known, is China's oldest and also largest international trading fair, both in terms of the venue size and numbers of global participants. So what does this year's fair mean for China and the world's economic rebound? And what do the latest economic numbers of China say about the growth prospect of China's economy? Before we loop in our panelists, let's take a look at this back on site and in person after three years. The largest ever edition of the Canton Fair has opened for business. It has drawn a record number of exhibitors, buyers from over 220 countries and region, and the expo space is a record 1.5 million square meters, with over 35,000 exhibitors and 40,000 online participants. Every year we find many new things, many new technologies, incredible. For example, the electric cars that we have seen now. Every year we're surprised by the, uh, all uh, what's happening. Uh, big uh, change. New exhibitors joined the fair this year, including industrial automation, intelligent manufacturing, and smart life products. As the barometer of China's foreign trade, the fair bodes well for China's resurgent trade and investments. The Canton Fair is an important platform for China to open up to the rest of the world in an all-round way, serve the high-quality development of international trade, and shore up the dual circulation development paradigm. National Bureau of Statistics data has shown that China's GDP grew 4.5% in the first quarter, a strong sign that the country's economic rebound is on track, with a marked improvement in business activity. The services sector led the recovery, with growth of 5.4% year-on-year. Investment in fixed assets increased steadily, along with investments in high-tech industries. This year's Canton Fair is a shout-out to global investors after three years of sluggish growth. China seeks to keep its policy of opening up and do its part in global recovery. For more on the latest about the Chinese economy, we are joined in Hong Kong by Hong Hao, Chief Economist at Grow Investment Group, in Los Angeles, William Lee, Chief Economist with Milken Institute. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. 4.5% first quarter growth, not bad, quite impressive in fact, Mr. Hong. Uh, yes, uh, it's a very strong set of results today, um, and I think it's beating the market's best expectation. Right, so I think four and a half percent for the first quarter, especially uh, if you remember uh, last year for the first quarter, uh, the Chinese economy is still uh, going steadily. Right, so you know the base effect is not as prominent as uh, it will be uh, in the second quarter of this year. Right, so I think going into the second quarter, we will see even faster growth. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the Chinese economy. Mr. Hong, I cannot hear you very clearly. I hope we can adjust that in a minute. But let me go to you, Mr. Li, about your take. Of course, that's 4.5%, 2.2% already year-on-year -year growth compared to last year. Uh, as we know, first quarter last year actually was 4.8%. But uh, this year's uh, first quarter, 4.5% uh, growth is the highest since the second quarter of last year. So. What do you make of this year-on-year -year growth it seems that we are seeing today in Chinese economy? 
I'm very impressed by China's growth, actually. It uh, has exceeded a lot of economists' expectations, including mine. Uh, everyone expected China to have a strong rebound from the COVID restrictions, and, and China is achieving that. More important for me is the fact that it's based on consumption and services, which is where the China policymakers wanted to shift demand away from the fixed asset investments, which China has way too much of, toward more consumption. And that's exactly the kind of pattern that we saw in the first quarter data. So, you know, tremendous success story right now. Meanwhile, we are also seeing some uh, interesting numbers. Uh, uh, if you look at the uh, fixed investment, uh, asset investment, including the manufacturing investment uh, and also the infrastructure investment, uh, both numbers uh, were not up. Uh, meanwhile, we also see uh, the service sector actually enjoying a rebound of 5.4%. And at the same time, retail is doing very good, more than 10%. So when you see a mixture of these numbers, what does it say to you, Mr. D? It, it, it tells me that, that uh, the China's recovery is now based on a healthier mix of consumption versus investment. Uh, and, and right now, the policymakers, uh, President Xi and, and uh, all the planners have been wanting to shift more of the aggregate demand into consumption, and the first quarter numbers are showing that. One of the things that uh, we have questions about, uh, at least the Western investors, is whether the consumption will be sustained for a longer duration. Everyone expected the consumption to be very strong after the COVID restrictions are, 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 were eliminated. But now, mm. will the income growth and the uh, property market, the wealth there, sustain the consumption? And that's the open question. But, but right. right now, the performance has been really very much on track to exceed the goals of uh, the policymakers right. for GDP growth of 5%. I want to go through some of the numbers with our audience once again to review this so that we know what we're talking about. Yes, you might be just uh, tuning into our program. China's economy grew by 4.5% year on year in the first quarter of this year, 2023, versus 2.9 percent in the last quarter of 2022, posting a steady economic rebound. That is, of course, according to the National Bureau of Statistics from China, and that number came out today. Meanwhile, we also see, uh, uh, at the same time, tough international and uh, internal uh, situations in terms of uh, how to seek a future growth uh, potential. And uh, on that question, I would love to join, to be joined in the studio by Professor Liu Baocheng, who just came over to the studio, Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics from University of International Business and Economics, Professor. So what do you say about the mixture of numbers we're seeing today? Well, definitely we are on a recovery mode, but uh, we are not really at the full speed yet. And for those who are uh, already on track and survived, and they are able to uh, recover very soon, like the service sector, the retail sector. But uh, for those who are really, uh, really debt ridden, for example, in some of the real estate developers, it's going to be quite a difficult time. And also, selectively, we see the coastal areas are really covering uh, rather quickly. Mm -hmm. And because of the export driven drive, uh, it's still picking up, and uh, we achieved. Over the first quarter, 4.8 percent of uh, uh, our import and export, and particularly for export, we achieved 8.4 yeah. percent. So uh, the confidence is there, and uh, right now we just need another push, so that uh, you know we're going to have a full speed uh, over the second quarter of this year. Mm. Of course, it's a very complex picture, uh, Mr. Hong. If you could hear me clearly, I hope I could still hear your voice clearly this time. Uh, uh, some of the numbers, according to the National Bureau of Statistics provided by the Chinese side, semiconductor fell about 15 percent for the first quarter. Of course, uh, uh, it's a very interesting area to look into. It shows the complexity uh, of the Chinese economy that we're talking about as things evolve internationally. So how do you see you know, where the future focus can be for the Chinese economy? Yeah, well, I think, you know, for the uh, uh, first quarter, uh, retail sales uh, is very strong. It's substantially higher than expected. And it shows that, you know, the domestic demand uh, is recovering. And also, you know, uh, in the, in the uh, months of January and February, uh, property sales has been picking up as well. So normally, you know, when property sales pick up, you know, people would, you know, tend to follow up to buy 
uh, home furnishing, uh, home appliances, et cetera, et cetera, to, you know, refurbish their houses. Uh, so I think as a result, you know, the uh, first quarter retail sales numbers are just, you know, way exceeding expectation. And I think um, um, in the coming in the coming weeks, uh, because mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Labor Day Golden Week is coming, right? So uh, we're seeing booking uh, on the uh, internet for uh, hotel accommodation and on flights. Uh, it's, it's going uh, ballistic as well, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, 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 retail demand continue to be strong going into the second quarter of this year, and therefore, you know, a strong GDP growth in the second quarter as well. Mm. Well, anybody that I've been talking to actually over the past few days, asking them as to what they are going to do with their May Day holiday, you know, it's a Labor Day holiday for China. Everybody's talking about, I need to travel somewhere just to have some fun, you know, after three years. So it seems that things are rebounding, but not in the so-called revengeful way, uh, quote unquote, there was so-called revengeful uh, consumption, but it didn't happen yet. We do see more... Uh, dynamism in the Chinese economy and also personal consumption. Having said that though, one of the things we need to look at is trade. Uh, the Canton Fair, one of the longest history, uh, you know, trading fair uh, based in China is taking place right now. We know, according to some members that got on hand, 800,000 new products displayed online this year. Meanwhile, about 500,000 are green and low carbon products, indicating enterprises are paying more attention to green and low carbon environmental friendly products. That's a demand coming from the consumers. But to you, Mr. D, uh, what kind of details and messages will Canton Fair and some of the other similar events might be providing us as an indicator about where the trade is heading for and what does international environment mean for uh, China, for China, which is one of the largest trading nation in this world? One of the loudest messages that come from that Canton Fair is that China is announcing to the world, we are no longer a low cost, low value added manufacturer. In fact, we are at the cutting edge of advanced technology, uh, artificial intelligence and smart stuff. Right. The Internet of Things is now not only uh, uh, part of China's development, but China is developing the Internet of Things. And I think that's a very strong message to say that trade, which has always been a very important part of China's growth, now is shifting in quality to the mm -hmm. high quality, high value added stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that uh, we need to, to, I think, focus on is how to sustain that kind of innovation for China. Because as you know, technology never, the leader in technology never stays the same because there's always somebody who innovates and creates something different. And right now, China's Canton Fair, the products that are being shown there is showing that China is a source of innovation. One of the things I wanted to say that Professor Liu said was very important is the unevenness of China's development. The coastal cities are doing very well, but I think the, the development plans to have innovation centers in Chengdu and in, in the West is also a very important feature mm. that I think uh, can be featured in the process of the Canton Fair because many of the innovation, innovative products are coming from these Western innovate, innovation centers. Mm. Uh Go to you, Professor Liu, also about the Canton Fair. I mean, it's not just a trade fair that you would take it for granted, you know, one of those, but rather it has always been like a weather report almost, you know, about how China open, how open China is and has been or was, uh, how it is today. Um, it is uh, a very in interesting indicator. Uh, many who have been familiar with the Chinese uh, economic growth uh, uh, of looking at as reference, Mr. Liu. Yeah, I had attended Canton Fair a dozen times mm -hmm. uh, as a trader uh, when I was working for London Expo Corporation, who is a named icebreaker with China. Actually, uh, we do notice such an exciting change in the 80s and 90s uh, when I was doing the trade. Uh, there were display of shovels, pickaxes, you know, right. the uh, raw materials, peppers, and etc. So uh, the uh, very popular quality description was FEQ, fair average quality. But right now we do see that uh, it is not only there to provide utility, but also provide inspiration mm -hmm. to people who are there to, on the innovation track uh, all over the world. So this is something that I feel very much a proud 
And also, as you say, that this is really a parameter of the Chinese uh, aggressive growth uh, in terms of the export, and also the Chinese uh, aggressive exploration into the new frontiers that are able to cater to the world and they are air uh, to not only to share with the trading partners, but also uh, to share with the R&D uh, labs uh, that are there to be available around the world. Interesting to talk about the evolution of the Canton Fair as a, a, a tool to check uh, what is the state of the Chinese economy. Uh, Mr. Hong, uh, I'm sure you remember the time when Canton Fair you know, uh, in the 1980s, uh, it was still a very internal fair in a, in a way. Uh, uh, mainly the, the Chinese uh, traders go there and negotiate with the other Chinese traders for businesses. But then uh, after China's reform and opening up, uh, lo looking into the second decades, you see more international ones uh, coming into the Canton Fair. When China entered uh, the uh, World Trade Organization, Back in the early 21st century, you also see, you also saw a huge amount of international visitors, including from North America, Europe, and etc. And then there seems to be a break of some wars. And then you see with the Belt and Road Initiative, more guests coming from Asia, Pacific region, and also along the Belt and Road Initiative, the countries and economies there. So you see this evolution of the Canton Fair in a way to tell the evolution of the trade of China. Yes, well, I think you know China's uh, trade with uh, foreign partners has become even more sophisticated than before. Uh, me myself is a Cantonese, so I, I well remember you know back in <laughs> 1978, you know when the Canton Fair first opened for business, right? So, uh, and ever since then, you know Ch China has come a long way. Uh, I think nowadays, you know, if you look at the export structure, right, so I think, you know, even though the uh, U.S. is still one of the major partner, uh, uh, a trading partner with China, but I think the uh, the exports to the Asian uh, countries is actually uh, the biggest component of Chinese exports these days, right, so, uh, um, um, so it, it is really showing that, you know, how the trading partner has evolved over time. Uh, and also, you know, in terms of uh, the uh, structure of exports, nowadays, you know, China is exporting more value-added, uh, more sophisticated goods uh, to the Asian and also to the European uh, and, 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 and U.S. as well. So I would say that, um, you know, if you look at, you know, today's uh, China's uh, trade figure, right, so in, in March, uh, the export growth has, you know, has been like substantially outpaced expectation because of huge backlog. Uh, uh, that is in the system uh, because of um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, slowdown in the last quarter of last year. So I think you know going into the second quarter, you know if uh, if the uh, uh, the uh, European countries and also the U.S. economy slows down a bit, mm -hmm. then it could affect uh, Chinese exports. But I think Canton Fair is a leading indicator for the health for the Chinese economy and also for the overall global economy as well. Mr. Lee, at the time, we have a lot of discussions of disruption of global supply chains and value chains. We also see geopolitics exacerbate what we already witnessed earlier. Uh, so now, uh, looking at Canton Fair and you know the upcoming CIIE in Shanghai, for example, early in early autumn as well, you know, how can we figure out a better way of dealing with the current challenges? together, hopefully, starting from trade. That's always a thought-provoking question, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, and we've discussed many times in the past how the, the two largest economies in the world, the United States and China, really have to get together and establish a trade framework, especially for these advanced technology and intellectual property intensive type of goods. We need to have a framework that says we good, have the good rules of the road so that both countries can benefit from world trade and not be uh, and to, to be competitive, but not to view that competition as a zero-sum game. And that framework is yet to be established. And once that framework is established, mm. I think we'll see tremendous benefits in trade 
spilling over to the rest of the world. Mm. But unless we get that framework done in a cooperative way, uh, that's the biggest threat right now. That China's innovation, American innovation, need to be integrated. What if they're not integrated? We have two different systems. Then we have two different sources of innovation, and then the world will have to be split between this choice of China versus U.S. And that would be disastrous. Mr. Liu, I want to ask from another angle. If you read the carefully the document coming out of the 20th Party Congress of China last year, one of the things mentioned about trade and international rule is about the updates of rules of WTO, and you know, um, and, and that also is uh, closely related to what we are discussing today, trade and also economic growth. So how do you see, you know, a crystallization of trade, at least in the eyes of the Chinese, the Canton Fair, in a way could provide us with more thoughts about how we can work with the others as well on updating the rules uh, and also to collaborate as much as possible, even out of complex situations? Well, these rules are really based on the basic principle of sharing can really enrich the people's life and also can uh, support the professionalism through the division of labor. Mm. And it is only human that we are able to uh, trade. And in order to trade, we need to, common, uh, to have a common rule book to play. And this common rule book should be uh, open, yeah. transparent, and inclusive. So uh, uh, merely by adding more ideological constraints into the trade can really disturb the uh, international trade order and also uh, in the end hurt their own constituencies, be it any politicians in any corner of the world. Mm. So we talk about the numbers, we talk about trade, which is criticized, uh, uh, reflected by the Canton Fair. But gentlemen, before we, we go, we still have uh, about five to six minutes. I really want to talk about the prospect because China's growth and rebound should not be just about one quarter. It has to be about sustainable growth. Also, China has been talking about high quality growth. That's the key word here. So how do you see uh, the signals sending by the first quarter of 2023 could help us to see the future of both high quality growth, sustainable growth? Mr. Hong, I go to you for that. Okay. Um, well, I think the authority has been advocating for a consumption-driven uh, recovery uh, this time around. And I think we, we actually see uh, the signs of you know, consumption recovery in the first quarter. So I, I wouldn't say that is sort of, you know, uh, 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 the quality is not up to scratch uh, in the first quarter. And I think going forward, you know, we still need to see uh, the housing sector uh, um, uh, do better, you know, because in the first quarter, you know, the FAI, and also property investment is still uh, registering negative growth. All right, so it is actually dragging uh, uh, Chinese growth uh, uh, in the first quarter. So I think uh, going forward, you know, if we can have uh, consumption growth ongoing and then we have you know, uh, property recovery as well, then I wouldn't be surprised to see in the second quarter, you know, the Chinese GDP growth, you know, could be as high as 8%. Mm, consumption property, I'm taking notes right here, uh, Mr. Hong. I'm taking notes of the direction you're talking about. Let's see whether it works or not. Uh, go to you, uh, Professor Liu. Yes, actually today I just attend, uh, attended a, uh, a launch conference as how we can review uh, over the first two years of the Chinese uh, 14th five-year plan. And uh, this is really something that's encouraging, organized by uh, the National uh, Reform and Development uh, Commission, and they are there to uh, see how uh, really we fared uh, through the difficult years of the uh, past uh, with the pandemic disturbance. And now looking ahead, uh, we are seeing several directions. One is that uh, right now it is still the restoration of confidence, both on the supply side and on the demand side. That is really the main theme. But uh, uh, moving forward, uh, particularly over uh, the uh, next half of this year, uh, we are seeing that we are going to have a holistic approach. It's not only the uh, growth figure, but also uh, how we can really integrate the environmental considerations and how we mm -hmm. can in, uh, integrate on the uh, high quality uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, we need to uh, move forward and th I think the uh, uh, the government uh, have a number of tools uh, so that uh, they are able to stabilize the like economy what? Like what? and also, to, uh, well, for example, 
uh, in the uh, interest rate and monetary policy and also the fiscal policy to transfer uh, to uh, cater more to the uh, innovation driven companies and also to support a more open and liberal trade uh, in many other areas and particularly in the Hainan Island where the free port is under very tough uh, and schedule uh, as how we can really uh, you know, declare. Uh, it is really something that is open to the world yeah. and it's going to benefit the further opening of Time China. Table. Yeah. Yeah. Timetable is supposed to be 2025, that's what I read earlier. Let's go to you, Mr. Li, indicators. The key to China having high quality growth is having balanced and sustainable growth. And getting balanced growth means, as Mr. Hong said, more consumption, but you need to sustain consumption with income. So addressing the high youth unemployment, ensuring that families' wealth is protected in the property market, expanding the portfolio of assets to allow savings to go into something other than property are the key ingredients to having sustainable domestic demand. The other thing is the trade issue having intellectual tr uh, property rights protection and mm. trade uh, with the advanced economies and emerging markets are is something that gives us the balanced growth and one more thing distribution of growth in china we cannot just focus on the uh, coastal provinces we need to look at right. how growth is spreading through the rest of china especially in the western provinces like uh, you know chengdu and, and, and Chongqing. yes uh, a lot of the geography study uh, here right now. Um, but before we go, I do want to ask a final, final question for every one of you. How would you describe what we are reading today, the latest data? If you can use one or two adjectives, what are you going to say? Uh, Mr. Lee, can I knock on your door first? Very briefly. Good start. Good start, but let's sustain the strong momentum we have. Got it. Professor Liu? Well, I think it's a rosy prospect, but it's still on a slightly bumpy road, and people's confidence are there. And now okay. uh, we need really to go for high quality growth, not only on our manufacture and service, right. but also on brief. our people. Okay, go yeah. to you, Mr. Hong. Recovery is here. Wow. Okay. Very positive messages coming from these three gentlemen economists that we are relying on today to have the latest analysis of the Chinese economy and what they mean for the rest of the world. Thank you so much, uh, William Li, Liu Baocheng, and Hong Hao. Appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today. If you can find us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. Thanks for watching. See you back here tomorrow.